Hey everybody, it's uh, Louise's Bible study again. Um, I'm going to try to get through um, a number of messages dealing with Christmas. And so they're going to be about 18 minutes, 20 minutes long, because that's uh, about as much as y'all's concentration at one time can handle of me. But <clears throat> so bear with me, we're going to do a number of segments on this. So what I'm teaching today is not going to be the completion, it's just going to be the beginning. But we're going to talk today about the manger scene and the nativity. And, you know, we're going to talk about some myths and things that are true and aren't true. And it's not a heaven or hell issue. So don't everybody get all upset. And uh, if you happen to follow my teaching and go and have dinner somewhere and say, well, Miss Louise said blah, blah, blah. You know, you don't need to do that because we don't need to get in an argument over it. But I just wanted to kind of, as because my husband is a historian, um, I just kind of wanted to set the record straight on a few things because uh, we have myths that are put in here and we have truths and we need to find them out. Um, you know, Christmas time is a time of giving and everybody, as I have said last week, gets all caught up in the gift giving. And you know, this season has been really difficult because suddenly it's everywhere. Everybody's talking about, well, we're not going to have as much money to spend on gifts. And then we had this horrible tornado that went through about three or four states and just demolished people's homes, businesses. And there are families, huge swaths of families that are, forget about gifts. They're not even going to have a home to stay in. That That's the least thing on their mind right now. But they have children. And these children have grown up looking forward to Santa and Christmas gifts and so forth and so on. And they don't want to disappoint them. But I think we have taken Christmas so far in the wrong direction. We have made it so secular. We have made it so much about things. And I is going to go and kind of pick it apart. And let's get down to the nitty gritty and talk about what Christmas is really, really meant to be about. God gave the most precious thing he had, his son. Now, some of y'all just take that for granted, but what if, what if, what if you had to give your son to, to not only give him as a sacrifice for others, but what if you gave him as a sacrifice for you that you knew people would not receive? Would you do that? I don't think so. But God gave his only begotten son as the greatest gift that could be given for all of eternity. And, you know, he didn't come, this is going to sound a strange statement here, but Jesus came not to be born, but he came to die. He had to be born in order to die. And, you know, he, deity cannot die. Humanity dies. And so, yes, he was 100% deity, and he was 100% humanity. But it was humanity that, that operated in this earth for 33 years. And it was humanity that went to the cross. Because you can't kill deity, but you can kill humanity. And that's who laid the life down for you and me. And even though it was deity that was laying in the manger, manger it was the 100% of humanity that fulfilled God's purpose in Jesus. Um, gifts are momentary. You know, you can have a gift and you can get it and you open it up and you're all excited about it. And probably within a week, two weeks, even a month later, the, the glitter, the fun, the newness, all the things about that gift have worn off. And suddenly, you know, you kind of go on your way and you start looking for something else. Because gifts never fulfill a permanent need in your life. They only fulfill a momentary need in your life. But you see, Jesus, the greatest of all gifts, 
will fulfill your greatest need in your life for all eternity. Jesus, the gift that God gave was the gift of joy. It was the gift of peace everlasting. And it was the gift of salvation and spending all eternity in the presence of the Father in heaven. And there is no greater gift. And this gift that you receive in Jesus Christ keeps on giving and giving and giving. Because you know what? Just the moment you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's just the beginning. Because God has so much planned for each one of us. And that gift just keeps on giving and giving and giving. Even in the middle of the worst, most horrendous circumstances, God's peace, His amazing grace, can keep you beyond anything you can imagine. It is amazing to experience that kind of peace and joy that passes understanding. And I guess I'm saying this, I don't believe people that are have been devastated in these states are listening. They're too busy trying to put their lives together again. But if you know it and you can pass it on, the most comforting thing you can give them is if they don't know Jesus, this is a good time to talk about Jesus and eternity. And the other thing is, if they know Jesus, they can be assured that God has got a plan. And it's a plan to get them out of the situation that Satan created. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm stopping right here because I don't want to hear any of this out of Christians. God did not cause this situation. Satan is the God of this earth. He is the God until his lease runs out and his lease runs out at the end of the tribulation. And until that time, he rules and reigns. And all of the catastrophes and things that are coming up I'm going to tell you, it's not global warming. No, it's the demonic warfare that is going on in the heavenlies getting ready to come against everyone. And it's just going to get worse until Christ takes Christians like us out of here. And boy, when we're gone, it's really going to get bad. Sorry to say that. The babe is eternal life. Luke 2 if you've got your Bibles, I wish you would turn there. I'm going to read this story. I'm going to read the whole section. And then we're going to talk about it uh, in, uh, in, in, in bits and pieces. So let's go and let's read it. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this census first took place while the governor was in Syria. Now let me say something. Rome had a census, which was a taxation on the Jews, not because they really wanted their taxes, although Rome really wanted their money regardless, but it was not a taxation for their government. You know what it was? It was because they didn't trust the Jews, and they wanted to know exactly how many there were so they could keep their finger on top of them in case the Jews decided to rebel against the Roman authority. It was a power grab. Sound familiar? Should. And it says this census first took place. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. They had to go back to the city that they were born in. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Joseph and Mary both were of the lineage of David. Now, Joseph was not Jesus' father. The Holy Spirit was Jesus' father. But Joseph was his parent guardian 
while Jesus was a child and as he grew up. He was a step-parent, so to speak. But Mary and Joseph had been prophesied to be from the lineage of David. Now, why Bethlehem? Why not some other place? Why not Galilee? Why not Nazareth? Why not? Why Bethlehem? Because Bethlehem was where David grew up. David was born in Bethlehem. David grew up in Bethlehem. And so therefore, God in his divine purpose had Jesus born in the very city that David, the king, was also born in. You know, it is amazing, honestly, when you look back and see how the Old Testament prophecies and how they mirror exactly what has taken place, I don't know how you could possibly deny that unless you just are so blinded by Satan in your mind and your understanding. Because God is very explicit for us to understand all of these things so there is no mistake. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say that Bethlehem was uh, was uh, was also prophesied in the Old Testament, and uh, it's it um, it had to uh, they had to go home. They had to go, both go back to Bethlehem because they both had been brought up and born in Bethlehem. So God has you know what <clears throat> God could use a census. He could use a tax census to accomplish His plan that he had for for Jesus and through this tax census it was his plan the way he got Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem he didn't just now I'm, they had I'm sure a unction from the Lord that this was something was coming up but he didn't give them a heads up on everything but he set up a plan that they had to follow to get to the point where God wanted them so he could accomplish his purpose. You know what? God's got a plan for every one of y'all. You don't see it. Maybe you see it as a negative. I'm sure Mary and Joseph saw as a negative, have to go, she's so pregnant, and have to walk, walk all the way back to Bethlehem at this time in her life when they're about to have a baby. I mean, they couldn't see the the, the the picture and there are a lot of times that things God requires of us and sets things up for us to do we have no clue what the final outcome is we don't have any idea I certainly didn't have any idea when God told me I'd be coming to Tuscaloosa Alabama and it took a long time for that purpose of why he sent me here to this town to be fulfilled in my life but he had a plan and he had a purpose and he was going to make sure that I stayed here until I accomplished what he had planned for me to do. And each one of us have to understand the circumstances may not seem to be lining up for you like you think they should, but we are not to follow circumstances. We are to follow after peace and after the leading of the divine Holy Spirit. So they followed after the Holy Spirit, and they went back to Bethlehem. And it says in verse 5, To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Oh my goodness. You know, we've talked last week about how difficult this time was. Because being betrothed back in that day was not like it is being engaged today. When you were betrothed back then, it was as if you were married to that individual. You just had not a com completed the fulfillment of the union. And so when you were betrothed to somebody, it was pretty much an unbreakable contract. And here's Mary, a young woman, and, and what's amazing about this story is she didn't run and tell Joseph right off the bat. It said she meditated on these things in her heart. And while she's meditating on these things in her heart, she's beginning to show her pregnancy. And Joseph suddenly, I mean, he's like, uh, excuse, excuse me? 
You know, what's going on here? And the angel <clears throat> did not come to Joseph until after he had approached Mary and said, what is going on? And she said, I am pregnant with the Messiah. Now, let me tell you what a man of integrity he was. Most men would have said, let me tell you something, woman. You can just hit the road. You have been unfaithful to me. I didn't bring this child about. Obviously, you've been with somebody else. I'm just going to throw you aside, and you will be banished in the Jewish community. He didn't do that. He said, you know what? I don't know how you got pregnant. I really don't, but you know what? I'm going to stand by you. We're going to go through this thing together. And it was after that that the angel appeared to Joseph and told him what was going on with Mary. That's a man of integrity. And you know, when Mary said to the angel, be it unto me, that was the moment of conception of Jesus because she made the word that was given to her personal. And let me tell you, until you make God's word personal in your life, it will not be unto you. You have to receive God's word just like Mary received God's word and made it personal in her life. The next thing that happened was it says, they, um, and so it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Uh, I'm just going to say this very quickly. Number one, uh, Mary was extremely pregnant. Now, I don't know, you men have no understanding, but boy, I'll tell you what, when you're pregnant, 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 you don't move around well. You don't even walk well. You look like a waddling duck, and you're really miserable. And the idea that she would be walking to Bethlehem, no. Her husband put her on an animal so that she wouldn't have to walk, and he put her on a donkey, which is probably the cheapest of all transportation at that time. So she rode a donkey into Bethlehem. And when they got there, it says there was no room in the inn. Well, let me explain just quickly about what it was like in those days. Um, inns back then were dangerous places. Uh, inns back then, people would rob you Thieves would come into your room during the night and steal from you for whatever you had. And God knew this. And so there was no room for them in an inn. That was a blessing. So they had to go somewhere else. They didn't have a letter of recommendation, which you had back then, to go stay with anybody else. And so what did they do? They had to go to a stable. Now, they either went to a stable or they went to a cave. Either way, it doesn't make any difference. What they had to do was they had to, and you know what? This was a blessing because she had privacy. She didn't have all the people around that were strangers intervening in on this situation. She had privacy. And, uh, and, and in, this, in this moment, she brought forth Jesus, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, which is strips of cloth. And I'll tell you what kind of cloth it is. It's like cheesecloth. And for women that have been, are cooks, you know, if you put milk or whatever, and you're <clears throat> trying to make yogurt or cheese, uh, you put it in cheesecloth and it drain, the water drains through and it's, it's a very porous cloth. That's what he was wrapped in. So we know it was summertime because he would have been very, very cold wrapped in the swaddling. And so... Uh, this, this is how Jesus came into this earth. I've got a lot more to say here, but I want to finish up by reading one thing. And my husband's anxious because I know he anxious. wants us to finish up, but I've got one thing to say. Why did Jesus 
Why did God go to shepherds before he went to the Magi? The Magi came to worship a king. The shepherds came to worship a child. I'm going to tell you why. If you look over in Psalms 23, Jesus came into this earth to be our shepherd. He shepherded his flock into the eternal kingdom that God had planned for his children. He did not come into this earth as a king. He came as a shepherd. And he later became a king after he had died and completed the plan of salvation that God had him to do. Isn't that wonderful? And you know what? David knew that because this is the psalm that David wrote about Jesus and him. Psalm 23, and I want to finish with this. I want you to listen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, so many of y'all right this season feel like you're walking through the shadow of the valley of death. He says, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I just want to leave you with that wonderful comforting psalm to know that a shepherd was born on Christmas Day, but a king is sitting on the throne of God. Hallelujah. We'll pick up from here and we'll talk more about the shepherds, the angels, and the magi. I love you. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.